follow the Austrian cycle through. Okay, and so the book, which was originally going to be very small, became quite large. I'll show you a copy of the book. Um, there it is. That's <clears throat> the book that I wrote, and it talks about the Austrian school. And I found that the Austrian school is extremely accurate when it comes to talking about trade cycles and business cycles. It's also extremely accurate in some of the economies that it's pulled out. And we'll talk about the successes. Now, <clears throat> I've uh, told Dr. Matchek that I, this is available. If you need the PowerPoint, um, he's free to, you're free to use it. Uh, you may want to do it in term papers or something. There's a lot of information there that you can use. So you don't really have to copy anything down. You'll be able to get this uh, sent to you, I guess, or whatever. I normally send my stuff to my students. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about it, <clears throat> the crisis <clears throat> excuse me, that we have, it's artificially created. And it's created by the expansion of bank credit. There are a number of explanations for the trade cycle. And remember, there are four trends that go on in all of economics. There's seasonal trends, structural trends, frictional trends, and cyclical trends. And what we're really looking at now is a cyclical trend. In other words, if you take a look at the American economy, which you see right from the beginning, as you see this ups and downs of business. And there are two explanations for it. One is non-monetary. One economist, uh, actually traced it to sunspots and solar activity, uh, held by Majevans. And um, Schumpeter traced it to new inventions. And the Austrians trace it to the expansion of bank credit. And what we see is, we see a um, um, idea, or will we, this whole thing was caused by the expansion of bank credit in a number of ways. Now, if you'll notice, uh, it tells you that the whole thing they thought they could mathematically model the economy. And for some years, they had all these mathematicians in, in uh, New York and whatever else, physicists coming up with all kinds of formulas uh, to model the economy, and all of them failed. If you uh, want to see a, a really, really good uh, <coughs> rendition of this, <coughs> excuse me, get a hold of, uh, or you can go on the YouTube, and get a hold of something called the Trillion Dollar Bet. It's about 45 minutes. It's one of the most exciting things put out by PBS. And it explains the disaster that occurred when a number of Nobel Prize winners in mathematics and in um, uh, economics tried to figure out how to eliminate risk with mathematical equations. And of course, it, it was a complete disaster. Uh, they lost about a trillion dollars, which at that time was the budget of the United States government. So I'm very critical of this whole concept that you can mathematically follow the economy. It, it, human beings are different, and it doesn't quite work that way. OK? <clears throat> the other thing was is that it was a bailout of institutions under the too-big-to-fail doctrine. OK? That was the second thing that kept this going. And we have the, um, the bizarre notion, as I've mentioned, that you can get rid of market principles and come up with um, government regulations, et cetera. And I can remember when I was when I, the book was being published, it was published in 2012, I would get on the air, I'd be on the uh, radio or TV, and um, they would ask me, they say, well, don't we need more government regulation? I say, I absolutely agree with you. We have to regulate the expansion of the money supply to the supply of gold, and that will stop it. Oh, they didn't want to hear about that regulation. All kinds of other regulations, but not the one that really works. Okay? Um, we said that uh, if we take a look at it, um, uh, these were um, uh, various people who said this. Uh, these are uh, mainstream economists who said they were soul-searching over the failures of economics. And the most evident, the inadequacy is the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, those of you who are in finance will hear about this efficient market hypothesis um, and the uh, bedrock of modern economics. And uh, it really proved to be quite a failure. And if you take a look at who said this, okay, it was uh, from The Economist magazine, Krugman, and 
Krugman, who's been very much in favor of government regulation, by the way, he suggested in 2005 that they stimulate the economy and the housing industry. And then he came out later and criticized it. And he said, modern economics, macroeconomics is spectacularly a big mess. And I, I attribute that to the reliance on mathematical equations to figure it out. Uh, this stuff just simply does not work. Okay, um, now if we go on, we say there's a, there's a different approach necessary. Uh, it's one that understands how the crisis was generated. In other words, if you want to find out what something went wrong, you want to go back and say, well, what caused this? Where did this come from? Um, one that can explain the crisis. In other words, how, how can we explain what went on? And one that has an effective remedy. Okay, so we have three things. What caused it? Can we explain it? And is there a remedy? And I, I uh, in my book, I said any system of economics has to be able to do those three things. If it cannot say the cause, the explanation, and the remedy, probably it's going to lead you in the wrong direction. OK? Now, the roots of the Austrian school, if we take a look at it, it goes back, really, to the University of Paris in the, in the 1200s. Well, the Austrian school is very old. Uh, we could trace it back even into Greece to Aristotle, and then finally the University of Salamanca in Spain in the 1500s. Now, these are the roots of it. Okay, and um, it then traveled from Vienna, where the Austrians were left Austria uh, because they were on the Nazi hit list, and they eventually settled in New York. Um, uh, there are other institutions, uh, Irvington and Hudson Fee, I think you've probably had uh, Dr. Reed, uh, Larry Reed speak to you, who uh, manages that institution. And then, of course, the Mises Institute in Alabama. Okay, these are some of the sources of it. Uh, New York University is where Ludwig von Mises taught. Okay, <clears throat> we say that it begins with Aristotle. Now, there's a a great statistician, um, rather controversial man, and he wrote a book called Human Achievement. And he went back and he said, who was it that contributed to our, our daily lives? Who were the people who laid the foundations? And he went back to 800 BC. He took physics, he took engineering, art, music, etc., and he went through the histories of these things. His name was Charles Murray. And he said, who does everybody look to? In other words, if you go into the history of uh, biology, the history of logic, history of metaphysics, history of ethics, history of uh, politics, they all come back to Aristotle. Okay? In other words, it all begins with Aristotle as the founding genius. Those computers that are run, that you're running on now, are all run on his logic. Okay? So that's how far it goes. He actually, <clears throat> he actually predicted that probably slavery would end. Now remember, he's writing 300 years before the birth of Christ. And he said people would probably turn to machines. You can imagine a man 300 years before Christ actually seeing that at some point a machinery would come in and people would rely more on machinery. OK, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was the man who brought Aristotle back into vogue. He had been sort of forgotten for about, um, about a thousand years. And Thomas Aquinas brought him back in. And his, um, his idea on the fact that the individual intellect is so powerful is really the basis of, of liberty. If you were here yesterday, uh, you notice I talked about that, that every individual, every single one of you is so unique that there is no, there'll never be another one like you and there never has been anyone like you. Each one of you has a particular talent that nobody else will have. It's irrepeatable, OK? And because of that, individual freedom is necessary to allow that talent to come to the surface, OK? And if I try to control you or someone tries to control you, they're stifling that talent. And so Aquinas is arguing very much for the freedom of the intellect. He was considered a rebel in his day. You have to understand that he was very, very much opposed by the authorities of the time. 
And um, of course, he set Western civilization on its path. Um, he, his people, his students, went to Spain, formed the University of Salamanca, and most of our economic theory starts really in Spain, in Salamanca. Okay, and Adam Smith drew from Salamanca, Spain, the rest of them at that university. And uh, they apply his thought to economic questions. And the interesting thing was, is that they were for free trade. They wrote about free trade. They understood how money is put into an economy and how it changes things. They were against, they were very much in favor of private property and they were against government regulation back in the 1500s, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the School of Salamanca was credited by the Austrians as being the foundation of their school, and they applied uh, St. Thomas to uh, economic and political questions. Um, they convinced the Pope uh, <clears throat> to issue an encyclical in 1506 prohibiting slavery in the New World. And the punishment, if you were involved in the slave trade, was excommunication from the church, which at that time was a very, very serious matter. Today, uh, people are not quite as religious. But if you were involved in slavery, you got excommunicated, which sort of meant that you had a one-way ticket to the wrong place, according to that. And um, they convinced them that the slavery was uh, completely wrong, and uh, the Vatican issued this encyclical. OK, now their contributions to theory. Most of the theory that you study in your classes, your microeconomic theory, and a good deal of your monetary theory, and especially your financial theory, comes back to the Austrians. And we'll go through each one of their contributions. As you'll see, um, they contributed to especially finance with regards to the time value of money. Um, all of your uh, price theory uh, comes to them, but they were non-mathematical in explaining that. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, we see that the first one is Karl Menger. Um, he starts out with Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and he develops price theory and the principle of subjective value and marginal utility. Now, he didn't call it that, okay? He, he didn't have all the fancy terms that Alfred Marshall did. Alfred Marshall was the one who, who uh, put all the mathematical equations in. Menger, <clears throat> very interesting man, uh, graduated from Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Uh, we say he was Austrian, and I, when I teach this, uh, I have a lot of Polish students who come up and say, oh, Mr. Breiser, he wasn't Austrian, he was Polish, because he taught, uh, he got his degree in uh, Poland. But at that time, that part of Poland was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, he was a nobleman, von um, Menger, he did never used it. and. Um, he noticed that economics did not explain what was happening on markets. He didn't go into teaching. He became a reporter on the financial markets. And he was in the financial markets in Vienna. And he said, you know, he said, the way prices are set in these markets have nothing to do with the standard textbook. And so he wrote a book, Principles of Economics, which explains how prices are set on markets very accurately and the marginal utility of principle and investments and structure of production. And he actually is the father of the information age because he was the first one to come out and say in his economics book that information has enormous value. Okay? And technology was one of the four pillars of the division of labor. Okay? Uh, his student, Eugen von der Bark, um, his whole theory was uh, capital and interest. And if you're studying finance, you're studying time value of money. And he was the first one to point out that a dollar today is much different than a dollar a year from now. And think of it. Let's say that I um, uh, owed you $10,000. And I said to you, you, know, you want your $10,000 now, or do you want it a year from now? And you'd say, what? All of you would say, well, I want it right now. Who knows what uh, the year will bring? So he said, in order to get you to uh, uh, not demand the $10,000, I have to pay you a premium. And that premium is called interest. And it came into the time value of money. 
I know one of the fellows here at breakfast is majoring in finance, and you're probably going through time value of money. This is the guy who invented it, okay, uh, in his book, Capital and Interest. He also was one of the chief economists to refute Karl Marx. He came out very hard on Karl Marx and said, this system, uh, and refuted it, he said, does not understand risk. And uh, really pointed out how uh, when the, the employer uh, or takes the risk, and the employer has to do what? Has to do all the investments, and the laborers get the money first. They don't have to wait till the product is sold, where the employer has to. And Manger used the time value of money to completely refute Marx, and uh, it set up kind of a, a war between Marxists and Austrians ever since. Okay, <clears throat> uh, von Wieser, a uh, very interesting man. Uh, again, one of the three original Austrians uh, was a student of Menger, and uh, Ma he points out cost is opportunity cost. Okay, that all costs are what? Opportunity cost. What sets the price you're going to sell your car for? The next big, the next bidder. Let's say you you're renting apartments. What's going to set what you pay for that apartment? What the next guy will pay. Okay. In other words. This whole concept, and we use this concept completely in economics today, the concept of opportunity cost. Okay? Uh, he also laid the basis for the criticism of socialism, that socialism cannot understand opportunity cost because the, uh, the prices are set by the government, not by the market. They have no concept of opportunity cost, and therefore that the economy would do what? Would be a disaster because there's no way to economically calculate. Okay, <clears throat> um, Frank Feather actually applied um, the, uh, the principles of von Binmark to the financial markets, and he was the, really the father of modern finance. Okay, so what I'm mentioning to you is the Austrian school has very, very deep roots in finance and economics, um, and it gives them a lot of their credibility. Okay, uh, Ludwig von Mises was the dean of the school, uh, he perfects the trade cycle theory. Okay, in 1912, he wrote a book called The Theory of Money and Credit. And he then lays out explicitly how trade cycles operate and the expansion of money substitutes called fiduciary media that enters the economy, that creates the distortions, and as they create these distortions, it sets up the house of cards which will later collapse. And this absolutely followed the, uh, the um, from 2000 to 2007, the economy absolutely followed their cycle. Okay? And that's why I, I was able to, fortunately, um, get out of the economy. Um, it's interesting. I got Christmas cards from my students um, telling me, you know, dear professor, you saved me a couple hundred thousand dollars in my IRA. I was in the bathroom at uh, the Red Lobster, and someone came up and said, you're Harry Verizer, I had you. I said, yes. He said, I was a stockbroker. He said, I'm very popular with my clients. I followed the Austrian theory, and I got all my clients out of the market. Okay, and as I say, 2000 uh, to 2007 followed it almost exactly. You could follow the cycle, okay? And Mises was the one who perfected the trade cycle theory. Uh, Hayek uh, also uh, was his student and very close friend. Uh, Hayek wrote and debated Keynes, uh, later a Nobel Prize winner, and wrote a very famous book entitled The Road to Serfdom, okay, in which he explained that um, the increasing of government regulation would lead to what? Less and less freedom. Hayek also is very, very important for his contributions to the theory of individual action and the reason why action at the lowest level is most important. Because a person, for example, um, Dr. Matchek knows a lot more about you than President Pretty does. The further up the food chain you go, the less information is available. And Hayek said an economy to operate efficiently has to know, has to be operated at the lowest levels. The shop foreman knows who to put with what machines. 
The bureaucrat in Washington does not. Okay. Um, this was the debate. Now, folks, I would advise any of you, if you enjoy going on the internet, most of my students do, there's a whole series of uh, actors who put together a Keynes versus Hayek a debate on the trade cycle. And um, now, you have to understand, these guys knew one another. Uh, Hayek and Keynes were good friends. And they, they and their wives used to go out to dinner. They were highly critical of one another in um, economics, but they were good friends, um, and um, it's the clash that defined modern economics. If you're interested, just go on. It's entertaining, because as one guy, he looks like Hayek, the other guy looks like Keynes, and it shows the debate going on, okay? So just type in into your um, uh, YouTube, Keynes versus Hayek, it'll come up. Also, the trillion dollar bet, that'll come up. The nice thing about this technology is so much is available almost at your fingertips. Okay, <clears throat> Murray Rothbard, uh, he was the historian of the school. Um, his work changes the historical thought. When I was in college, we were told, okay, that the Great Depression was caused by laissez-faire capitalism. And we were, it was pounded into our heads. And when I found out, when I did the research, I found out it was just the opposite, that the Great Depression was caused by an expansion of the money supply, and the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which later collapsed the economy in 1929, and it lasted to 1942. And Rothbard was the fellow who brought that out in his, um, his book on economic depressions and trade cycles. Now, if you're going to go into any kind of financial advising, and a lot of you might, because it's a growing field. Why? Because my generation is retiring. And we're looking for good financial advisors. If you're going to do that, if you're going to serve your clients well, you have to be familiar with trade cycle theory. Okay? And Rothbard would be a good place to start. Okay. Uh, Henry Hazlitt, I think you probably, uh, they probably have you reading his uh, economic text. Uh, he popularized economics. Okay? Uh, Hot talked about idle resources. I'm just running through the Austrians some of their contributions, particularly on um, the concept of, um, of uh, uh, the effect of labor unions in the economy and uh, what that does. And notice now we have, we pass right to work here in Michigan, which has, a, um, has had a noticeable effect in bringing industry back. Uh, Leonard Reed, the defender of the free economy. I think uh, Dr. Reed has talked, this is not Larry Reed, but it's Leonard. Uh, talked here at, um, at Northwood years ago. Okay, now, I want to get into it. Mark Skousen, um, for the more advanced of you, The Structure of Production. It's the book I use in my advanced um, macro classes. It, it's probably one of the best books written on macroeconomics. Uh, and I think Dr. Skousen has talked here, and uh, he really understands trade cycles and how they operate. Uh, now, <clears throat> the Roger Garrison, this is some of the, um, the stages of production on the trade cycle theory, uh, which ties it together. Okay, and um, if we, a lot of these are pretty complicated. Um, if we had a chance, if I ever, ever come back to Northwood, I'd be glad to do a whole series or a whole lecture. Uh, for you on the trade cycle, going into the details, uh, if you have an interest in that, okay? Okay, Kersner, um, another Austrian, studied the whole effect of entrepreneurship and uh, understood how the entrepreneur operates. And I can tell you from being an entrepreneur myself, his, um, his description is absolutely accurate on how entrepreneurs work over the cycle, over the theory. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the accurate predictions. The Austrians accurately predicted the crash in 1929, as they predicted the crash of uh, 2000 and the, the crash of 2007. Okay? Um, they warned of the collapse of communism and socialism. They said that system will not work uh, under uh, any conditions. There's no price system. There's no way of organizing the economy. Um, they described the bureaucratization of industry because of government bureaucratization. Um, one of the things I tell my students is this. 
is your your situation is tougher going into the workforce. You might say, well, wait a minute, everybody tells us that. that. But here's why. Because industry has become less entrepreneurial and more bureaucratic. Now, the uh, if an automobile company wants to produce a car, a good deal of the cost, at least a good about a billion bucks, if Chrysler, Ford, or whatever bring out a car, at least a billion dollars, is satisfying government regulations. Okay, and a lot of them, the, the fleet uh, um, fuel uh, things and all that, are really wasteful. Okay, let the market decide. Let the people decide how much gasoline the car is going to use, rather than the government. And <clears throat> you're going to do an industry, especially education, has become bureaucratized. Now, what do I mean by bureaucracy? It doesn't follow the market, it follows the rules. And so you're going to be hamstrung in a lot of ways in following all these rules, which drive up the cost of doing business. It raises the break-even point. I'm sure all of you are familiar with break-even point. And what it does, it makes it much more difficult to operate. Okay, <clears throat> now, the important thing is they anticipated the inflation that went on, the credit inflation that went on. Okay, <clears throat> um, Ruff uh, recognized the coming of world inflation. Um, Hayek foresaw 29, uh, predicted the end, and Rebke anticipated that deficit spending and inflation would become a permanent part of the uh, welfare state. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is Mises' prediction on inflation, and I'm going to follow through with you exactly what that meant. He said, every type of government meddling with private enterprise results in disastrous consequences and paralyzes initiative and breeds bureaucratism. Okay? In other words, that's what you're facing going into industry today. Okay? Now, he also said this. When you have inflation, when you have credit inflation, who does it affect most? It affects people at the lower end of the scale. Okay, and what we see now is, and remember, there's all these people running on what? The distortion of the distribution of income. Where's income? Where's all this money? It's in New York and Washington. The economy we have now is stalled. Okay, and the average person, the average family in this recession, lost five thousand dollars worth of income. In other words, the income was about, uh, was about $5,000 less today than it was in um, 2007. The take-home pay has dropped. And the reason for that is the rest of them are saying, well, it's market conditions, et cetera. No, it's inflation that's done that. Because remember, in inflation, who wins? The person who gets the money first. Okay, if I asked you, if, uh, if I start handing out money here, okay, let's say we start, we just start increasing the money supply. You want to get it first, or you want to be first in line or last in line? You want to be first in line. Why? Because the prices haven't gone up yet. Money is not neutral. Okay, um, I tell my students, I said, uh, let's say I have that uh, that container there of coffee, and let's say, okay, to pass this course. I'm going to give each one of you a container, and it's got water in it. You have to drink it before you leave the room. Well, the water is neutral. It goes in and goes out. If that were scotch, most of you and I couldn't get out of the room. Scotch is not neutral. It changes the body. And there are certain types of drugs that you can take that change you permanently. Now, when you inject money into an economy, you have two possibilities. Possibility number one is everybody gets the money at the same time. Possibility number two is some people get the money first. And the people who get the money first are the people who are what? Are going to benefit. Now let me give you an example of that. Let's say that you retire from Chrysler Corporation and you're fortunate enough to get a pension, which is a thing of the past, and uh, you get 2000 bucks a month. Okay, and that's fixed. And so suddenly now the Federal Reserve or whoever starts pumping up the money supply 
the money goes into housing, what does it do? It pushes up the cost of housing, the price of housing, and suddenly now you get your tax bill, which the house is based upon the market value of the house, and the house now is worth two or three times what you paid for it. Therefore, your taxes are two or three times as high, but your salary hasn't increased. Okay, that's the important thing about inflation, is that your, your costs go up. Your income stays the same. And that's one of the reasons why now we're looking at things doing good doing what? Stalled. This economy is stalled. Okay? Uh, there's a little bit of activity in certain areas, but not all over. And this is exactly what is predicted. Okay? Now take a look at the amount of the change in income since 19. 70, uh, this is about 70. In 1971, we were on the uh, quasi gold standard. And in order to fight the Vietnam War, okay, we inflated the currency. Now, by the way, uh, there's Verizer's Law. Verizer's Law is this whenever a government goes to war, the currency is going to change. Okay? And if you take a look at the history of the United States, in the Civil War, the currency changed. In World War I, the currency changed. Prices, by the way, during World War I doubled. Income did not double. World War II, currency changed. I saw it happen in Vietnam. We used to have silver uh, coins. Gone. Because of the inflation to fight the war. Okay. Price of gold, before we went into Iraq, was somewhere around $400 an ounce. Now it's $1,200 an ounce. Why has that price moved? Because of the tremendous inflation necessary to fight these wars. Okay? Now take a look at what's happened. I wish this were a little bit bigger, but you'll get it if you get this uh, down. Now I've gotten this from all kinds of sources. This is the Census Bureau, and it actually comes from Mother Jones Magazine. Okay? Which is kind of a lefty magazine. But it shows that the top are doing what? They're doing great. Now why? Because the money is flowing into New York, companies are borrowing money from the Fed, and what are they doing? They're buying back the stock of their companies, driving up those prices, and who owns stock? The upper four or five percent of the United States owns stock. Most people don't own stock. So in other words, you're seeing the market going like this, right? And the regular economy is like that. It's not reflective of the market. And the a lot of people are thinking that there's going to be some major problems with the stock market, which um, is quite possible. This gives you the average uh, household income, the change, and notice this goes to 79. I'd like to trace it back to 1970, because that was the last time we were on the gold standard in which there was any kind of monetary discipline. Okay? There has not been. Uh, and if you take a look at the shares, now take a look on, on the second. This is from the Congressional Budget Office supposedly um, objective. Notice who's benefiting from the inflation. Okay? The upper uh, income earners. The rest of us are stalled. It's a stall. All right? Um, taxes tell a story. Who's paying the taxes? The people with the money. So what you're taking a look at is the highest quintile are paying about 70% of the taxes. Because why? They have the money. Okay? Um, to who's good? Uh, that's the inflation adjusted um, household income. And if you take a look at it, uh, it doesn't show the numbers, but it's flat at the bottom and it's uh, increasing at the top. Okay? Uh, differential prices. Now, <clears throat> remember I said when you increase the money supply, it affects everything in the economy differently. Take a look at the prices. Listed property is purple. The money supply flows from the Fed into the banking system. The banking system then grants the mortgages. The mortgages become increased demand in the housing supply, and it pushes up the price of houses. Notice what's happened. The next one, the green. Money supply is flowing into the stock market. It's pushing up the stocks. Notice education. 
okay, the student loans. Now, I know how to solve the student debt problem and the student loans. And the colleges will have to compete to get your business, and the prices will come down. Okay? Believe me. Uh, I gave this talk at Central Michigan University, a talk like this, and one of the professors came up to me and he said, uh, he said, the prof, he said, uh, you know how many students, more students Central Michigan has today than they had in 1971? I said, no, he said 42%. He said, well, how many more faculty do they have? Well, about 41% more faculty. He says, how many, guess how many more bureaucrats we've got? I said, 100%? He said, no, 636%. Okay? Now, who is paying for that? All this bureaucracy that's larded in education. Look in the mirror. Okay? Look at your statement. When I went to college, I paid, and this is back in the uh, 60s, and these are gold dollars. I paid about $20 a credit hour to go to a private school. Now, if you multiply that by 10, it should be what? 200, right? And the University of Detroit at the time, the president actually would go around at night, Father Steiner, and lock the buildings. And the president and the vice president had one secretary. Okay? And not today, what does University of Detroit have? Graduates of tuition, 1,000 plus a credit hour. They have a whole building called the Fisher Building full of administrators. Okay? Now, where is that coming from? If you have competition, if they had to compete for your dollars, believe me, things would change. Because competition brings prices down. All right? I mean, in those days, there was no student loan. And none of us graduated with debt. And I went to private schools. I didn't go to public. Public was even uh, easier than that. So as this inflation has come out, where's the inflation gone? OK? Um, I, at one time, was uh, administrated the college, helped to administrate Hillsdale College. And I know how these prices are made. How are they made? They say, OK, how much can the student afford to spend on the education? And how much can the student afford to borrow? This is the new price. Okay? I'm, uh, now you know why I'm only an adjunct professor at Northwood, right? But I'm just telling you that this kind of thing, when you pump that money into the economy, it has effects. Okay? It has effects. You take a look at the CPI. The general price index hasn't gone up this far. The general price index has been relatively mild compared to education, medicine, Okay, why is medical cost so high? 50% of medical costs are paid for by government. Okay, and that is what? That's money being inflated. Okay, um, edufation. Uh, it's student loans financed by government, and just take a look at the cost. Um, the textbook thing. Uh, I tell my students, I say, here's the textbook. You can get any edition you want, because <laughs> they're all the same. They just change the chapters around, OK? And so you don't need to pay uh, $300 for a book. You can get it on Amazon for $10.95. And so uh, I'm kind of controversial, by the way, <laughs> in saying this stuff. But I'm only up here once, so you might as well hear it, <laughs> OK? But uh, this is my criticism of it. And this is building in uh, the stock market. What's pushing the stock market up? Yeah, it certainly isn't the bottom of the economy, because the bottom of the economy is stalled. Okay. Now, the fellow from the Federal Reserve said uh, last night, and I asked him, I said, you guys can't raise interest rates. This whole concept that they can raise interest rates is crazy, because if they go from 2% federal borrowing the 4% federal borrowing, they're going to eat up most of the revenue generated by income taxes to pay the, uh, the in increased cost of interest for the federal government. Okay? Most of the loans, international loans, are written in dollars, which means the dollar will, will strengthen, and all these small countries will do what? We'll have a much higher time climbing out of debt. It's not possible. 
Okay, it shows you the margin. Now take a look at the second one. It shows you what? As there's people are borrowing money to go into the stock market, the stock market is rising. It's being pushed up by that. Okay? Uh, now, let's go back to the, the cause. The Great Depression came about uh, 1929. It was really, really um, as gestation period in World War I. And um, <clears throat> the Republican administration of Hoover put in a large tariff, which collapsed world trade, called the smooth Holly tariff. And the gold standard was abandoned so that they could print money for that wonderful adventure called World War I. Okay? And the, how'd they finance that? They printed money. The money supply in the United States doubled from 1917 to 1920, and so did the prices. So whatever, if you bought a pair of shoes for five bucks, you paid 10 bucks in 1920. And it started the inflation. Now, it caused the Great Depression, which we'll go into a, another lecture. Um, and so the idea was the Brits, who at that time, the British had a tremendous effect. They were the world's largest empire. They said, look, we know where this is going. Let's call and run an economic conference. Let's restore free trade and restore the gold standard. And Roosevelt, um, not having much economics, blew it apart. Everybody agreed to do it. It would have prevented uh, Germany and Japan from having to go to war to get resources. And it blew it apart. And then um, this is um, a quotation from Roosevelt's Secretary of State, who said, this is where World War II began. It was 1933. Why? Because when you have a tariff and you don't trade, how do, how do countries get resources? Well, they go to war, okay? Germany and Japan are highly dependent on international trade. And what happened? The military got in power, and the military has another way of solving economic problems, okay? Now, I want to go through the successes. What do we need to do? Okay, uh, the Bretton Woods Conference, 1945, was a tremendous step forward it allowed the prosperity that you're living under today, okay? And uh, it brought what? GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and it brought a modified gold standard, okay? Um, that was done in Mount Washington Hotel in uh, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, called Bretton Woods. It's like the Grand Hotel, if you ever go up there, all right? Um, the United States, what happened was it boomed. Everybody predicted that there would be another depression after World War II. There wasn't. There was an enormous boom starting, and it lasted all the way. That boom lasted all the way to what? To 1971. The income of all sectors of the economy grew at the same rate, 33%. In other words, people were living 33% better in 1971 than they were living in 1945. A tremendous boom, okay? And it was based on two things, free trade and sound money. Now, let's go through the countries that followed it. These are the countries that followed the free trade and sound money proposition. Germany, remember Germany was defeated. If you take a look at Germany, what it looked like, I'm going to go backwards. Oh, I'm going to move forward. Oh, that's good. Okay. This thing doesn't want to. Pardon? Oh, I'm hit right here. Here. Okay. This is Germany, 19, 1946, 47. Okay. Completely bombed out. By 1957, that same street is completely revitalized, okay? All right? Um, the guy who did this, these things are great until you run into problems. Well, I guess I'm not going to see if I, no, it's not going to go backwards. It will only go forward, I guess, okay? Um, 
the guy who, there is Earhart. Earhart was the, um, the economist. Earhart was the economist who designed the German economic revival plan. It's exactly what we're going to have to do here, all right? So when we take a look at it, I guess I point up here. Okay. Um, his plan was the economics of success. Now, uh, what was his plan? What was the, the German economic plan? Okay, Rebke, uh, an Austrian economist, was the guy who did the design. All right? Uh, he warned on the welfare state and chronic deficits and inflation. Okay, and this was a German economic miracle. Now today, Germany is what? Is the powerhouse of Europe. They're the number four economy in the world. There's us, China, Japan, and Germany. Germany exports more than Japan does, or more than China does. They're an export machine, okay? What did he do? He returned the German currency to a gold basis, the mark. And today, even the Germans did not like giving up the mark for the euro because the mark was so strong. It was the ideal currency. He lowered tariff barriers, and he moved Germany to free trade. He abolished wage and price controls, okay? Uh, he lowered taxes, and he privatized industry. And he wrote into the German constitution that Germany could not run the deficit, could not run deficit spending. Which industry did he, uh, uh, did he privatize? Volkswagen. Volkswagen was normally, was founded by Adolf Hitler, okay? And Hitler wanted to do for Germany what Henry Ford did. So he said, well, Ford came up with the Model T, I'll come up with the Volkswagen, okay? And um, they privatized industry, and Volkswagen has become one of the major uh, manufacturing uh, companies in the world, all right? Now notice that, free trade, free markets, solid currency. Okay, <clears throat> this is what's called the Wirtschaft Wunder, again, a uh, demonstration of the Austrian economics. These are Austrian economists who pulled this off. And um, you can see again exactly what, uh, what was done. Okay, <clears throat> this is the economics of success. This shows German unemployment from 1945, look, it was about 10%, and by 1970, it was almost zero unemployment. By the way, today Germany has the lowest unemployment in Europe. Okay, the Germans are not suffering from unemployment. Okay, um, Germany under Austrian economics. It shows you the value of the Deutschmark. Notice the Deutschmark, very strong versus the dollar. Look at the German currency, very strong as the United States currency is weakening because of the QE2, okay? And on the other hand, you have the growth of the economies, which uh, he'll send you this so you'll be able to study it. And you can see exactly what these folks did, okay? Uh, Germany from 1945 to today, another picture of the same spot. Uh, notice the change. Uh, Jacques Rueff, the French economist, okay, who uh, also a member of the Austrian school, who revitalized France under Charles de Gaulle, uh, was president of France, uh, and he put Rueff in charge. Germany followed, France followed the, the uh, German recovery, okay, and the French economy boomed, started in 59, lasted till about 68, until de Gaulle left office, the socialists then took over, and France has been a basket case ever since, okay? Um, now, this is Rueff. Uh, he, he wanted to put the world on the gold standard um, and to follow the German example, okay? Now, in the recent days, did you know that Poland did not undergo the um, recession or the boom? The Poles are not having a recession. The Poles did not increase the money supply. Their central banker, Vasilevich, okay, refused to increase the money supply and to create a housing boom. And what he did was he took Poland over from a communist country. There is no mess housing mess in Poland. 
And um, the essence was what? Okay? He tightened uh, government spending, lifted wage and price controls, okay? Removed obstacles that, uh, that was hurting the private sector. And uh, Poland is the one country that came out of communism as the most prosperous. The Polish um, uh, income levels have soared. They're about two or three times what they were under the communists. Uh, enormous what? Movement up in the, uh, in the Polish uh, government. And this is from Forbes. By the way, I put most of the uh, resources there uh, so that you can, you can trace my, um, my path the way I went through this. OK? Um, Vasilevich followed Mises and Hayek, recognized the importance of private property rights, saw that state planning and government regulation was a disaster, and uh, recognized the importance in people's lives. Um, again, this is the Wall Street Journal. Uh, notice that the um, U.S. dollar equivalents from, from 1990, okay, per capita GNP, GDP was $1,600 a person. In other words, the Polish worker was producing $1,600 worth of stuff. 20 years later, almost 20 years later, they're producing 10 times the amount of stuff, 13,000 per worker. Okay, so the, if you take a look at it, and if you compare Poland, this is, the, um, this is the comparison of Poland to what? To all the other communist countries. And you take a look at which country came out the top, okay? Ukraine, down 50%. Okay, and they, they, by the way, have kind of a quasi-socialist government. Um, uh, uh, take a look, Belarus, uh, Finland did not even do it. Finland did better. But Poland did what? Poland led the pack. Okay? I mean, it's pretty hard to argue with the facts the way they were. Okay, uh, the Marshall Plan did not do too much. Um, it it uh, bailed out maybe Great Britain. But West Germany was the one who really prospered, and it's under free markets. OK, uh, again, Repke. Um, this is to German unemployment, the Austrian economist. OK, Erhard's word. It was taken place in Germany during the past nine years was anything but a miracle. So it's not a miracle. It's the result of what? Honest efforts with the principles of liberty. You're studying liberty in the conference here. And part of the thing I'm trying to convince you of, I'm trying to demonstrate to you, is that these principles of liberty work. Okay? It isn't just theory. This stuff works when it's applied. Um, and Erhard said it was what? It was liberty and the opportunity of using personal initiative okay, and human energy. In other words, here was Nazi Germany under Hitler, a totally controlled economy, gone to war, destroyed. And Erhard releases personal energy Remember I said at the beginning of the talk, each one of you is what? Completely different. Each one of you has a talent. And the trick of an economy is to do what? Is to release that talent. Okay? Is to release that talent. Erhard, a success by any, by any measurement, is saying that's what happened in Germany. It's not a miracle. We just did the right things. Okay? Uh, France. France did the same thing. <clears throat> Results came out fast. GDP rose by 3%, 7.9%, okay? 4.6, 6.8. Living standards improved at a rate of 4% a year. You heard um, the Federal Reserve guy here talking about 25 for the United States. Okay? The French released it. Now, later they had a student revolution. De Gaulle left office, and of course they went back to the same old stuff. And France, of course, is now a basket case. All right, um, <clears throat> let's take a look at Japan. Japan is another example of this. You know, Japan was the, uh, the 20th economy in the world after World War II. It was devastating, completely devastating. Now, there's a couple of things to explain Japan you should understand. The Japanese don't have a defense budget. They write in their constitution they can't have an army or navy. So what, where did all the R&D money go? It went into consumer goods. When I was a boy, Japanese stuff was synonymous with junk. Today, it's synonymous with quality. And the man who did that was an American by the name of Edward Deming. 
who went in and said, hey, let's put in quality control, let's start making quality products, let's encourage entrepreneurship, and Japan pulled its way out, so it became, uh, up until recent times, number two. Japan's problem is demographic. The United States left Japan with a problem, and that is population control. Population control demographics run the economy. We are having, we're going to have a major problem in the United States. Our uh, reproduction rate, to have as many of you as there are today, you have to have 2.1 children. We're at 1.9. Japan is way below that. Japan's becoming a geriatric house because the United States convinced them, some idiots in, in uh, New York convinced them from the Rockefeller Foundation to limit the population. China's facing the same thing. In 50 years, the Chinese economy will be half, of, uh, the population will be half. You can't build an economy on one kid. I mean, my Chinese students are fascinated with the fact that my dad had six. Okay, oh man, must be very rich to do that. Okay, so what I'm telling you is, folks, part of Japan's problem today is demographics. And if you read any of the financial papers, it will tell you that. But for that time, this fellow here, what did he do? He lowered taxes, lowered regulation. Okay, uh, another case of um, entrepreneurship under this prime minister adopted the program of moderate taxation, low defense, because we were defending them, so you guys can we sort of subsidized them because it was our defense that did it, okay? Um, high rate of personal savings, which were channeled into industry. From 1953, Japan grew at a rate of 9.7%. percent that would be five times what the Fed guy wants us to grow, all right? It was straightforward case of Adam Smith, uh, no Keynesianism. Japan, for the last, uh, since 1990, has been practicing Keynesianism, QE, whatever it is, hasn't worked. Okay, let's see if I can. I have the thing. Okay, that's Nagasaki in 1945. That's Nagasaki today. Okay, notice the difference. It's entrepreneurship, all right? Um, this is uh, Poland, Lesik Vasarovich, the finance minister, who was responsible for keeping Poland on the, on the, um, off the path, okay? Uh, Poland is the only country in the European Union to avoid the recession. It's been the fastest growing EU, okay? Uh, that's Vasarovich talking about private initiative, private property, uh, enterprise, um, and talked about uh, very critical of the socialist regime. Uh, Hong Kong. After World War II, Hong Kong was had a um, uh, income. The uh, personal income there was about 500 bucks per person, loaded with refugees. Okay, what did Hong Kong do? Establish free markets. Under and by the way, they didn't have democracy then. The, the Queen appointed a. Uh, an administrator, because it was a British colony, and the administrator came in and he says, there's nothing I can do, let, let business flourish. No taxes, free trade, relatively sta a stable currency, that's Hong Kong today, okay? It grows from 750,000 people, Hong Kong now has 7.1 million people, living at about real wages, rose by 50%, poverty fell from 50% to 15%, Okay, an average per capita income is two and a half times the world average. But then if you've been to Hong Kong, you can see the tremendous thing that that market has done. All right, um, this is the guy who did it, um, Sir J John James Cooperwaite. He was the administrator of Hong Kong. What was his program? Okay, uh, his program was allow the free markets to operate, allow personal initiative to operate, uh, and, uh, he's passed away now, he said that in the long run, the aggregate of decisions of individual businessmen exercising individual judgment in the free economy, even if it's mistaken, is likely to do less harm than the centralized decisions of government. And certainly, the harm likely to um, counteract it is faster. He did not allow economists to take any statistics on Hong Kong. 
And he didn't do that, he said, because if we take statistics, they'll want to control things. So let's just let the economy develop and leave the control alone. Okay? And of course, today, who followed Hong Kong's example? Red China. Red China looked across and said, hey, how and they were an impoverished country. Okay? They looked across and said, how did the Hong Kong people do this? Same, same people. How did they do this? And Red China, and I have a lot of Chinese students, adopted many of the principles of a market, adopted many of the principles of entrepreneurship. Today, China is now number two economy, but that's not quite the whole story because it's an emerging middle class, but the bulk of China is still impoverished. But they did pull an awful lot of people up. Okay? So that's uh, the story. And the story really is what I came back to. The first thing I said when I walked in here, all of you are different. We have to somehow release that energy that each one of you have, that entrepreneurship. And that's only done in an aura, in an atmosphere of economic freedom, stable markets, okay, and, um, and uh, less regulation. The economy now is stalled. Okay? I saw in the Wall Street Journal good news. Half of the college students who graduate will get full-time jobs. That's good news. What we'll about the other half? You see what I mean? In other words, as we regulated this economy, we were destroying that initiative. The, the um, monetary system is not allowing the proper amount of economic calculation to happen. And it's got the thing stalled. And my prediction is, unless things are changed to allow personal initiative, strong currency, and free markets, it's going to remain stalled. OK, thank you very much.